persecuted Christ's followers and even had a hand in killing Christians. In fact, he was instrumental in the murder of a man named Stephen who lost his life just because he preached Jesus. Now, when you talk about persecution, we're talking about the Bible says that some people were sown asunder. We're talking about real persecution, not like, you know, they talked about me. We ain't talking about your kind of persecution. We're talking about real persecution where because, simply because they said the name of Jesus, somebody cut them in half. They went to jail. They were tormented. They lost their lives. Let's look at Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3 in the NIV translation. It says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But look at verse 3. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now, again, persecution is jail, murder, torment, just because you follow Jesus Christ. And so here we see that Paul did in fact wrong somebody. He did defraud someone. But in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul said, I didn't wrong any man. How can he say that? Isn't he lying? The answer is no. Here in the book of Acts chapter 8, we are reading about a man named Saul, the old man of the apostle Paul. Come on, listen, stay with me. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, you're reading about the new man, Paul, who has now been born again and is living out of his new resurrected life. And whether you realize it or not, all of us used to have an old man. You may not be able to say what his or her name was like Paul did, like a Saul to Paul, but you all had an old man. You know, my mother, my mother is Hattie Monroe, but before she was Hattie Monroe, her name was Candy. That was her old, that was her old man. And then there was Ron Sane, who last night was sharing his testimony about how the enemy had been talking to him and tormenting him and trying to pull him back to his old man. His old man's name was Slim. But now he's Ron Sane. We all had an old man. We all had a Saul to Paul experience. And if you look through the New Testament, listen to me, you don't ever hear Paul talking about Saul. He does not talk about him. Why? Because Paul refused to have any identification with his old man. He wouldn't even acknowledge him. Paul was so convinced of this new man through the resurrected life in Jesus Christ that he never even associated with Saul. To Paul, Saul was dead. How, how many of you understand that an old man need to die? Your old man is dead. All of you had an old man. All of us had an old man. Paul was so serious about this that even in Acts chapter 20, verse number 26, he makes this comment about himself. He writes it out for everybody to see it. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 26. He said, wherefore, I take you to record this. Pay attention to what I'm getting ready to say and write it down. That I am pure from the blood of all men. How can he say that? He was responsible for the stoning of Stephen. He was responsible for cutting Christians in half. He was responsible for going into people's houses and dragging them out just because they named the name of Jesus. And here he says in Acts 20, 26, wherefore, I want you to take note. I am pure from the blood of all men. Say all men. All men. 
this shows his commitment to the resurrected life that Christ Jesus provided for him. He set the record straight. He said, I'm pure. Say, I'm pure. pure. And you go back to Acts chapter 8, 12 verses before that, and you see how Saul persecuted Stephen. But yet he says, I'm pure. I'm free from the blood of all men. Something happened. I want you to understand that the same thing that happened to Saul making him Paul is the same thing that happened to you. Your old man lost his life when your new man gained his in Christ Jesus. Y'all hear me? Your old man lost his life when your new man gained his life in Christ Jesus. And so no matter how hard your old man tries to live again, we will never, ever allow them to live again. Paul will never be Saul again. Hattie will never be Candy again. Slim will never, ever give, get life in this life ever again. Come on. We will all forever be Paul, somebody born again, powerfully made new in Christ Jesus. Say, I'm brand new. Say it again. Say, I'm brand new. I'm brand new. Now you can grab 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 14, where Paul said, If any man, anybody, be in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a new creation. He's a new creation. He goes on to say, Old things, that old man has passed away. This is why he put that word, look, look, listen, pay attention. Everything has been made new, and everything is of God. Thank you, Jesus. Consider this. A newborn baby doesn't have a past. How many of you ever had a baby in here? You hold your baby and say, you did all of that before you got in this world. No. A newborn baby does not have a past. And when you got born again, you didn't have a past. Like the newborn baby, spiritually, you don't have anything to look back to. Yes, it's true that you did things before Christ, and some of us did things after Christ. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. You may have a memory of it, but God doesn't have a memory of it. Your memory is not God's. That person doesn't exist anymore, so you don't have to live subject to that person's voice any longer. How many of you are in Christ? Raise your hand. Look, look around the room. Keep your hands up. Look, and lift your hand high so the devil can see it. I'm in Christ. Look at all of these people in Christ. Understand this. You must recognize the plot of the enemy to get you continually to see the past, identifying with who you used to be while not accepting who you have been made to be right now in Christ Jesus. It's an age-old trick. He did it to Moses. He did it to Abraham. He did it to Joshua. He did it to Isaac. He, and he tried to do it to Jesus. So my desire is to take some time to help you see yourself. To bring the word of God to you in such a loud and strong way that you will silence the voice of the enemy. I'm going to slow it down. Ephesians chapter 4. You got to get this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 through 24. And this is what it says. If so be that you have heard him. And have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Where's the truth? And we understand that Jesus and the word are synonymous. So when you say Jesus, you're saying the word. So he's saying the truth is in the word. That's why we keep looking at the word because the truth is in the word. The truth is in Jesus Christ. So here we go. Verse 22. He said that you, since the truth is in Jesus, since you're identifying with where the truth is, the truth is in the word. So look at what he says in verse number 22. Because of this, I'm saying this, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Meaning nothing good will ever come out of the old man. Never. 
When you listen to him, if you obey what he says, anything that he encourages you to do, nothing you do is going to be good. You're always going to feel low. You're always going to feel down when you pay attention to your old man. Look at verse number 23. He said, he said, put off the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, why did he put that thing about the mind between them verses of scripture? Because this, he's going to tell you something. He's telling you, he said, look at, see yourself as righteous. See yourself as redeemed, but you cannot do that if you don't deal with the way you think. You got to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. If you don't deal with your mind, even though there is a reality in your spirit, that reality will not come out of you if it's blocked by the way you think. If your mind is still connected to what you did when you was candy and slim and saw, if your mind is back here, you will never be able to live the resurrected life. And I'm telling you, you're going to be pulling thoughts down like a crazy person. But until you can master your thoughts by, by governing your life from your spirit, keep on pulling them thoughts down. So Paul is saying, when you put on the new man, you're putting on righteousness and true holiness. I love that word, true holiness. Now, reading this moves me to go into man on three dimensions. And I know that y'all know this. This is world outreach. We've talked this time and time again, but I'm going to share it again because I think it's critical for us to understand. Man is a three-part being. He is a spirit who possesses a soul and he lives inside of a physical body. The real you is not your body. The real you is your soul. The real you is, your, is not your soul. Excuse me. The real you is not your body. The real you is not your soul. The real you is your spirit. That's the real you. The day you gave your life to Jesus Christ, the life of God did not come into your body. It did not come into your soul. The life of God went right into your spirit, and it impacted your spirit. Now, your body will be influenced by the life in you. Your soul, when it's renewed to the word of God, will be influenced by the life within you. But when you accepted Jesus Christ, the life came into your spirit, man. So when Paul said uh, old things have passed away and all things have become new, he's talking about a work that happened in you. Because if you came to the altar and you wore a size 10, unless there was a creative miracle you needed for your foot, you went back to your seat wearing a size 10. So that song we used to sing, I looked at my hands and my hands looked new. I looked at my feet. No, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. How your hands were when you were at this altar is how your hands were. Why? Because the work was not done out here. The work was done in here. Are y'all listening to me? Amen. Now, when you accepted Jesus, Lord of your life, what was immediately impacted was your spirit. The work was done in your inner man, in your core. So I'll say it again. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live inside of a physical body. And I'm making this distinction because we have a lot of people interchanging the spirit and the soul, thinking that they're the same thing when they are not the same thing. Say this with me. I am a spirit. I I possess a soul. And I live inside of a physical body. body. Now, if you don't understand this, you're going to be crippled in understanding who you are and how Christ, the things that Christ has done for you will not be a reality in your life because your mind will fight against that. You live in a physical body so that you can come in contact with the physical world around you. The real you is a spirit being. It's why when you die, you leave something behind. When you die, your soul and your spirit leave the planet. But your body is left in the earth. 
And here's the powerful thing. We will know and recognize one another because we have access to our memory and our intellect when we get to heaven. But our body will not take the, he the heaven journey. Only your spirit and your soul will. So again, the real you is not your body. The real you is not your soul. The real you is your born again, spirit filled spirit. So when Paul says put on righteousness and true holiness outwardly, it's because of who you are inwardly. Consider this. One third of who you are is absolutely perfect. Man on three dimensions, spirit, soul, body. Spirit is absolutely perfect. No flaws, no blemishes, no sin, nothing. One third of you is already just like Jesus. One third of you cannot sin. One third of you is heaven ready right now. Your spirit. The work is done in your spirit. This is why you grab that verse of scripture where the word of God said, Christ is coming back for a church without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. Well, you know that can't be in the physical. Let's just deal with the wrinkles. Amen. Common sense tells you that when Jesus comes back because somebody has aged, somebody going to have a wrinkle. He's not talking about your physical body. He's talking about your spirit, man. He's coming back for a church, a called out group of people who don't have a spot, who don't have a wrinkle, who don't have a blemish in their spirit. And if you are in this room right now, you are born again. When he comes back, he's coming for you. I'm going to say it again. With all your stuff that you've been thinking, all the stuff you've been doing with your body, he's looking at that one-third of you. That's the part of you that God is always engaging with. You keep focusing in on the, 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 the two-thirds of you. And this is why you're having problems with the two-thirds of you because you won't, you won't cultivate the life that's in the one-third of you. Sin is not a problem for the person who lives on this side, who focuses on their spirit. You don't start having issues, thought problems, body problems until you get away from this guy here. That's why you got to keep your mind inundated with the word of God. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. In the morning, listening to the word. I get up every morning, I'm in the word of God. I go to bed at night, I'm in the word of God. Why? Because I have to live out of my spirit. Every promise that God has, listen to me, every promise that God has made to you, those promises will only be a reality when you learn how to tap your spirit. Yeah. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 11. Am I helping you? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14, it says this. In him, in Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him. With a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now, this is what Paul is saying in a nutshell. You heard the word of truth. The message of salvation came to you. And as a result, you, you, you heard it, you believed it, you received it. Once you believed it, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. In other words, God sealed your life. What does that mean to have my life sealed? To be sealed, if you look it up, I used to think to be sealed was like a Ziploc bag. You know, I take my food, I put my food in a Ziploc bag, and I go, zip, sealed. No. If you look up that word sealed, it's, it's a Greek word that's like a hagiomas or something like that. No, no, no. Wrong, wrong, wrong definition. But what the word means, what the word literally means to be sealed is to be branded. Like a farmer brands a cattle 
So you carry the brand of God and all the host of heaven, all the demonic forces know that you carry that seal. Now here's the thing. Look at your hands. Is there a seal on your hand? No. Look at your brain. You can't see your brain. But think about your mind. Is there a seal on your mind? No. Where is the seal? It's in your spirit. You've been sealed in your spirit. Now you think about this. Joseph, in the Bible, talked about how Joseph mixed the cattle and whatnot, and God's blessing and favor was on Joseph. Because that blessing rested on Joseph, what happened was Joseph, with his cattle, when Joseph's cattle came out, his cattle came out plumped and, and juicy and, and wonderful, blessed. But then the, the cattle of his father-in-law, they were weak and sick. What happened? That blessing, that blessing rested on Jacob. Jacob branded, his cattle were branded, meaning you could tell the difference between the cattle that belonged to Jacob and the cattle that belonged to Laban, his father-in-law. Why? Because Jacob had sealed, branded There was something different about the ones that were sealed. And what God is saying to you and me is, I've sealed you. And I did it with the Holy Spirit. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. It says, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest standeth ministering and offering sometimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins, can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered once, once, one sacrifice for sins, look at this. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, how many sacrifices? After he offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14. Let's read it together. Ready? Read. For by one offering he has... Perfected. Has what? Perfected. He has what? Perfected. He has what? Perfected. He has what? Perfected, Perfected how? Forever. Forever them that are sanctified. Now, Usually when we're teaching about the word perfect, we usually say now. When, you know, when the Bible talks about perfection, he's not talking about flawlessness. He's not saying that in your body you're going to live a flawless life and in your mind you'll live a flawless life. But in this verse of scripture, he's talking about your human spirit. Look at what he said. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Who in here is sanctified? Oh, just a few of you, huh? Oh, we'll do an altar call and get the rest of you saved. <laughs> Look at what he said. For by one offering, he only did it one time. He has perfected forever. Ain't sometimes in and sometimes out. Forever. Your spirit, one-third of you, has been perfected forever. Let's talk about the word sanctified. He said that you've been sanctified. If you look up in Hebrews 10 and then you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 30, it interchanges the word sanctified and holiness. The word means, it's a hegiamos, which means to be set apart, to be pulled out from among, to stand out. Now, moving this definition of holiness or thinking about this definition of holiness, if I were now to come to you and ask you, what's the opposite of holiness? Most people would say sin. But here the definition said holiness is to be pulled out, to be set apart. And this is critical for us to understand because the opposite of holiness is not sin. The opposite of holiness is sameness. Commonness. 
Look it up. It's not sin. You're not going to find sin in there. The opposite of holiness is commonness, sameness. And so what he's saying is that when you're not living a holy life, it means that you have blended in with everybody else. You blended in with the cattle that don't carry the seal. You've been blended in with the people who don't carry the brand of God. Ain't got nothing to do with sin. It has nothing to do with your mistakes. Help me, Father. So this is critical, and it explains why God separated us. He branded us. He sealed us. He wanted everybody to know that you belong to him. And so even if in your mind, your mind is playing tricks on you, Pastor Skip calls them Jedi tricks on you, even if your mind is playing Jedi tricks on you, it does not change the reality that you carry the mark of God in your spirit. And that one third of you is absolutely perfect. Well, I messed up. One third of me is absolutely perfect. The more time you spend on the fact that there's a part of you that's perfect and you start looking at that, the more you start looking at that, you ain't going to want to do whatever your body and your mind tells you to do. We keep making the issue of sin an issue. Sin is not an issue. Jesus dealt with sin already. Amen. Well, how does this translate to you and me? By sealing you, God wanted everybody to know that he made you different, that you're not the same, that you've been set apart. When those around you are sick, he set you apart to be healed. When those are around you are depressed, he set you apart to have inner peace and joy. When those are around you are struggling in their family relationships, even though something may hit your family, he's given you a way of escape. That's holiness. That's sanctification. We're set apart unto God so that we can worship him, so that the world can see him, so that we can model his kindness to the rest of the world. And those of you who have been sealed, we stand opposite of the ways of the world around us. We didn't, you know, we get hit. Things happen to us. Depression tries to come, but we don't acquiesce to it. We don't lay down to it. Instead, we remember, wait, 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 there's a stronger part of me. Amen. We're set apart for God in our belief, in our lifestyle, and how we think. Holiness is God setting you apart, bringing glory to your life so he can get glory from your life. Amen. So according to Hebrews chapter 10 and 10, we've been sanctified. We've been set apart. How? Through the offering, the one-time offering of Jesus Christ once and for all, once and for all, once and for all. Stop going around that mountain. Stop going around that mountain. Don't take that trip no more. Tell the devil, you done deceived me. This looked like the same mountain. I've been around this mountain 40 times. I'm not going around this mountain no more. You're not going to convince me that I'm not who God said I am. You're not going to take away from me what the Father has given me. I'm not going around this mountain no more. The buck stops right now, right now, today. Today, I recognize that one-third of me is absolutely perfect. Say, I'm perfect. Amen. Now, if you read the entire 10th chapter of Hebrews, it's talking about a clear distinction between how they handled sin and the blood of animals versus how Jesus is handled it under his blood and through his body. But let's go down to verse number 14 again and read that what it says. Let's read it again. Ready? Read. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering he hath per... That you need to sit with that. He ha you need to walk the floors of your house. He has forever perfected me. He has for e forever perfected me. I've been forever perfected. 
forever. You know how long forever is? How long is forever? That should be really good news to your ears. Because what it means in practical terms is this, is that Jesus made you perfect. He cleansed you. He set you apart. Look at your neighbor and say, I know you keep thinking about what you did. But Jesus cleansed you. And he made you perfect. Forever. Wait, keep talking to him. Keep talking to him. Keep talking to him. Tell him again. Listen to me. Come on, listen, listen. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm talking about the real you. Not the body you. Not the soul you. But the real you. That one third part of you. Your spirit has been cleansed. Made perfect. Once and for all. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 23. Says this. This is Paul. Well, they say it's the Paul because it's consistent with the rest of the writers. We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. But I believe the Apostle Paul did because it's consistent with the other books the way he wrote them. But look at this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23, it says this. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Who's the firstborn? Who's the firstborn? So he said to the general assembly and to the church. Who's the church? We are. He said of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Look at that. We keep striving, trying to make a hundred because 99 and a half won't do when you already there. He said, he said, listen, listen, and to God, the judge of all, read this last part to me. And the spirits of just men make, just men make, flawless. No spot, no wrinkle, no blemish, no such thing. Now, religion will tell you, you got to have it all together. And if you sin in the midst of your sin, the minute Jesus cracks the sky, you're going to hell. That's a lie. Why do we sin? Why do Christians sin? Why do Christians, why do Christians continue to practice sin? Because they have not renewed their mind. Does your lack of mind renewal negate the fact that you've been born again, that God lives in your spirit, and one third of you has been made perfect? Does it change that? No. No. What you will do is live a defeated life. Your life will be defeated. If you keep so into your flesh, your life is going to be defeated. But you're not going to hell. You don't go to hell because of what you did. You go to hell because of who you did not receive. Listen to me. We, people who die and go to hell, go for one reason. It's because their spirit man is dead. They did not accept Jesus and give him an opportunity to make them alive. That's why we got to get the gospel out. That's why we got to get the message out. So we can get as many people out of hell as we can. Not because they're living wrong. No. But it's because they're, they're headed to an eternal damnation. Simply because they don't know Jesus. Yes. Settle this. Paul 
said he was writing to the spirits of just men made perfect. Through the scriptures like these, we can easily understand that we have already been made perfect when we were born again. Once again, the life is in your spirit where the work of salvation of Jesus Christ was done. So when you read verses of scripture thinking that you don't measure up, well, I don't, I don't, he can't, I don't measure up. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Know that we're not talking about the things that your body has done. Saul to Paul. Candy to Hattie. Slim to Ron. We're talking about the new you. The recreated you. The born again baby that doesn't have a past. Colossians chapter 1 verses 27 and 28. And I'm going to be closing shortly. Colossians chapter 1. It says this, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man. Look at this. We're, we're, we're warning people and we're teaching them in all wisdom. Why? Why are you teaching them and why are you warning them? Why should we be teaching people and warning people? Why? So that, every, we, so that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's why we witness. That's why we hit the streets. Because we want to present men perfect in Christ Jesus. He's not talking about when you get to heaven. He's talking about right now. You can only present somebody to God spiritually perfect. Here Paul was saying that as a result of people responding to the gospel, that you and I can present other people perfect when they are in Christ. Every man, and that includes you and me, stands without a flaw when they're in Christ Jesus. So I can't come to you and say that I'm perfect in and of myself, but I can come and say that I'm perfect in Christ Jesus. My perfection is in my spirit. We have to identify with this, and we must make this a true reality in our lives, or we will keep vacillating between our present reality and our past. And eventually you are going to succumb to defeat if you keep thinking on the past. Anybody that knows if I'm driving my car, and my eyes are going in this direction. It's just a matter of time before my car goes in that direction. You can't keep looking behind you. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. It's a mirage. It's an illusion. It doesn't exist. Say this with me. I'm perfect in Christ Jesus. I'm righteous in Christ Jesus. I'm redeemed in Christ Jesus. I'm sanctified in Christ Jesus. I'm holy in Christ Jesus. Now say this loud. I am righteous. I am redeemed. I am sanctified. I am holy. I am delivered. I'm born again. I am perfect. Now, remember, it's in your spirit. You know, you can go home and tell somebody that don't know the Lord, I'm perfect. And be like, mm. Because they're paying attention to what your body is doing. They're paying attention to what your mind is thinking. But people who have the kingdom reality understand what you're saying. So when you say, I'm perfect, they say, me too. Amen. We're not looking at the old us. We're looking at who we are in Christ today. That's where our identity lies. It's in Christ. It's in Christ. And this is huge because every attack of the enemy will come against your identity. He doesn't want you to know who you are. And down through the years, he has used your behavior to cripple you and in many cases stop you from walking as God has ordained that you should walk. You keep thinking you don't measure up because you keep looking at how you messed up. You keep thinking about your behavior. God's not thinking about your behavior. Listen to me. He wants you to think about your behavior. That's why he said in Ephesians chapter 5, he said, imitate me. It ain't, God ain't up in heaven saying, why well, they keep messing up? He just said, imitate me. We're the ones down here making this a big deal. And God is saying, imitate me. Just do what I do. 
Love like I love. Forgive like I forgive. Do what I do. It's why Jesus said, I only do what the Father does. Amen. Satan doesn't have to worry about the nations being drawn to you when you have your own identity crisis. People are not coming to you when you got an identity crisis. When you can't hold your head up, why should I come to you? No, I want to walk with somebody that knows where they're going. And they stand in the reality that God has made to them. Are y'all listening to me? Satan doesn't have to worry about anybody following your God when you're confused about who he is and what he's done in you and through you in Christ. We've got to get this. We've got to understand these things because the nations, the goim, the people of the earth, every tribe, every tongue, they're waiting for you. Amen. Amen. This is not behavior modification. You get in the word of God and your, your behavior will automatically be modified. You get, in, you get in the word and you just do what the word says. When you have an opportunity to be bitter, you choose not to be bitter. I'm not going to be bitter. I'm going to walk in love. You just modified your behavior. When you got an opportunity to hate somebody, and you will have many, but you choose to do things and deal with people God's way, you just modified your behavior. For you men, when a, a cutie comes walking across your path, 36, 24, 36, what a winning hand. <laughs> Listen to me. And you struggle, you women, when Hercules, Hercules comes across your path and you, you got it in your mind that you can't I, can't, I can't help it. Yes, you can. One third of you can help you. So we're not, you're, you're, God would never give the devil a greater edge in your life than he has. Ain't no way. Ain't no way. Ain't no way. The devil's not stronger than God. He's not smarter than God. So you trying to tell me God's going to put his spirit on the inside of you, give you his word, and then still can't bring you to victory. And he's told you at the beginning. Now. For this cause was the Son of God made manifest, that he might undo, destroy, and loosen the works that the devil has done. He's defeated. But every time you allow yourself to think on the past, then he, get, he can he grab his, you know, he doesn't have any more teeth. So then he grabs the teeth off the thing, puts them in his mouth. This is why the Bible says he's as a roaring lion. He is not a roaring lion. He's powerless. But if he can get that in your head that you're defeated, if he can make you think in your mind that you're defeated and that you can't overcome, he, he can control your life. So now I want you to think on the perfection that you are. Say, I'm perfect. I'm perfect. Say it again. Say it again. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm perfect. I'm perfect. Listen to me. And you husband and wives. Jesus. Because we, we know how to pull the covers off of one another. And in, in, in our eyes... We demean and demon and, and devalue who our spouses are because we, we've gotten consumed with what they've done in their flesh. This is why we got to walk by faith and not by sight. I need to see you through the eyes of God and not through my own eyes. Through the eyes of God, you're a just man made perfect. Well, come on, let's thank God that he made us perfect. Thank you, Father. Thank you for what you've done in our lives. And Father, forever and a day, forever and ever, forever and ever, we're going to...
and to remember who you have made us to be. And Father, we thank you. Thank you for what you've done. I receive it. I believe it. I re Come on, say that with me. I receive it. I believe it. And it's a reality in my life. Now let's thank God. Come on, let's bless him. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you.